Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I have a very special guest, a legend in our field, and I'm so honored to present to you guys, Dr. Jeffrey Scher. Welcome, Dr. Scher. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Amy. Thank you. Call me Jeff. To be I will. Here. Thank you. I'm humbled to have you on here. Um, you know, I've been um, a huge admirer and a fan, and you know, the fact that you still want to change the world for fertility patients continue to inspire us, especially me, because, you know, people ask me every day, Amy, how do you do it? How do you wake up? You're working on a Sunday. I'm working on a Sunday. And I have to ask you, actually, what makes you still get up every single day, even on a Sunday to help fertility patients? Well, I've been doing this for 37 years, and I actually retired about a year and a half ago. I couldn't handle it for two reasons. The first was that I gave up the love of my life of what I was doing. And the second is that the real love of my life, my wife of 50 years, said to me, you're not staying at home. You're driving me crazy, so go out and get stuck in again. So I went back in again and uh, started up my program in New York, and here I am in Manhattan right now today. I love it. Okay. So the title of today's show is Immunologic Implantation Dysfunction, Unexplained IVF Failure and Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. And there's no one better to talk to us about this. And you've written a book about it. But for our listeners, I just want to share more about you. You're an internationally renowned expert in the field of ART. And you trained under literally the fathers of IVF, doctors Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards in the UK. And then you came to the United States in 1982 to establish the first private, non-university based IVF program, the fourth IVF clinic in the nation. And then you expanded your presence to include 10 IVF centers throughout the country before founding Share Fertility Solutions with offices in New York City and Las Vegas in 2020. And over a career spanning, just like you said, almost over over almost 40 years, right? You said 37. Um, You've been very influential in the births of over 17,000 IVF babies, and you've helped fashion the entire field of ART. And you've published over 200 scientific papers and abstracts and author of several books, including IVF or in vitro fertilization, the art, ART, Assisted Reproductive Technology of Making Babies. And more recently, what we're going to talk about today, Unexplained IVF Failure and Recurrent Pregnancy Loss, the Immunologic Link, which is available as a free download on your website, share shereivf.com. Once again, such an honor to have you on the show. You talked to us about what you're, you know, why you're, you know, still so passionate about doing what you're doing, but I also want to hear what drew you to the field of fertility medicine. I was friendly with a guy called Victor Lewis from England. He was the secretary of the Royal Fertility Society. And I was in the faculty at the University of North Carolina and he came to visit me in Chapel Hill. And he said to me, you know what? There's a guy out here who's a very good friend of mine called Patrick Steptoe and Bob Edwards, his associate. And they've started doing this thing called IVF. Would you like to get interested? Well, I'd been doing infertility work in South Africa before I moved to the United States in the late 70s. So I took him up at his offer and I went to the United Kingdom and I worked with Steptoe and Edwards. And I quickly realized there was nothing. Nobody really knew what the hell was going on. We were putting eggs and sperm together hoping that a baby would occur, and it happened maybe one in 10 times if you're lucky. But I learned the process when it was still all being done through surgery, laparoscopy to remove the eggs, and came back to the United States and opened the first private IVF program in the country in 1982. And uh, the rest is all history. Yeah. And how has your practice changed over time? I mean, you told us a little bit about how you were doing egg retrievals through a laparoscopy. Can you kind of describe the changes that you've seen? Oh, my gosh. I'm fascinated by it. I I mean, I know we could probably spend hours doing that, but I would just love to hear some of that. Well, you may not know this, but we were the first people in the world uh, back. And I wrote a book with with a couple of people some time back years ago uh, in which I spoke about stimulating women with fertility drugs. And we were the only people using purely gonadotropins. Those days it was a drug called Perganol. And we were using only that, and everybody else was using clomiphene and other forms of oral fertility drugs. 
And we went purely with injectable fertility drugs. Everybody thought we were crazy. But at the end of the day, the success rates proved that we weren't. And so um, we moved on into doing IVF with purely fertility drugs and laparoscopically. And eventually the things changed and uh, ultrasound guided egg retrievals became the vogue. So we got moving there and we just moved on. I opened, uh, my first practice was in Reno, Nevada. And then we opened in Sacramento and we opened in San Francisco at California Pacific Medical Center. There's a program still in California in uh, San Francisco on the Embarcadero, which I opened, uh, looks over the, uh, the bay and uh, went from there to Santa Rosa opened a program in uh, Los Angeles, Torrance, and then we went on from there to Dallas and it went on to, I don't know, Chicago and New York and Pennsylvania and all over the show. That's amazing. That's incredible. So now I'm excited. I want to dig into today's topic, immunologic implantation dysfunction, IID, unexplained IVF failure and recurrent pregnancy loss. And you have so much information about this on your website, but I also want to just dig a little bit deeper here on today's show. What is IID? First of all, you need to know, and I'm sure you do, 75 to 80% of all pregnancies that fail or are miscarried early on fail because there's something wrong with the human embryo. Usually it's a chromosomal abnormality, but it can be other things. It's usually irregularity in the chromosome number we call aneuploidy that causes the embryo to be, to be lost. You may or may not know this, but in 2004, we were the first to introduce PGT, PGS into the field of IVF. And um, there've been an estimated 17 to 20,000 births from selecting embryos in this way. Uh, of which 700 and something come from us alone. So we've done a lot of that, and we were involved very much in the evolution of these technologies. But 25% of failures to conceive or to retain a pregnancy do not relate to the embryo itself being abnormal, but rather to the implantation base being non-receptive. I call it a seed-soil relationship. You can't put a good seed in a bad soil and you can't put a bad seed in a good soil. The soil is the uterine lining, the seed is the embryo. So once you sort out the issue about how to optimize the competency of the egg, which is the most important determinant of whether an embryo is going to be normal, not exclusively, but most important, once you get that sorted out and you get embryos which upon um, uh, developing to the blastocyst stage prove to be chromosomally normal, and if you still don't get pregnant or you lose a pregnancy over and over, it's obviously more likely to be related to the soil, not the seed, than the soil's the uterine lining. And while there are hundreds of possible uh, factors that affect implantation, the three most important, which are responsible for more than 80% of all implantation failures, I call it implantation dysfunction for a reason that I'll mention in a moment, um, approximately 80% of these uh, failures are due to one of three things. Either there's something wrong anatomically with the uterus, that there are irregularities in the contour, which is why we do hysteroscopies and a saline ultrasounds to confirm the regularity of the cavity and avoid an irritation that will remove, that'll reject the embryo. The second is the thickness of the uterine lining. The uterine lining needs to be at least eight millimeters, ideally over nine, eight to nine being a kind of a gray zone and we published that for the first time in 1989. I love it because that's exactly what I tell people. My limit is nine, but then people say, oh, lining doesn't matter. The thickness doesn't matter. And oh, I'm like, it matters a great deal. I do. Well, I agree. Are, I, I agree. don't even, I don't even do transfers to uterus of the Right. It's to improve that. And we came up with some years back with Viagra and all kinds of things, but that's for a different day. And the third factor is immunologic. And to set the scene for that, 80% of losses in miscarriage that are sporadic, in other words, they occur just because women do mis miscarry, it's just part of being a human. Uh, 10 to 15% of pregnancies are going to miscarry. Maybe you have a pregnancy and a baby or two and then you miscarry again. 80% of those are still due to the embryo being abnormal. But in 20% of cases, it is not that. It's due to a, re a rejection of the embryo from the uterine wall. If a woman repeatedly miscarries over and over, the chances are 75% likely 
that she's losing it not because of the embryo, but because of an implantation dysfunction, something wrong with the implantation process that prevents the embryo from gaining a proper grip into the wall of the uterus, and so it comes away. And how do you know you have this dysfunction? What kind of tests should someone ask their doctor for? And how does someone get help from, from you to figure this out? Well, the basic things that we all do, we do a sonohistogram or a hysteroscopy on everybody within a year or 18 months of doing a transfer to make sure the uterus is normal. We check the thickness of the uterine lining, which in spite of what you may have heard is critically important and you've got to have it fixed. In other words, it's got to be at least eight, but preferably over nine millimeters with a trilaminar appearance. So clearly if the uterine lining is fine and there's nothing in the uterine cavity and you know you're putting back embryos into the uterus that are likely to be competent, chromosomally normal, and she's still not getting pregnant or she's miscarrying, the most likely explanation is an implantation failure. And then you dig into the immunology because 80% of them are one of those three things. And if it's not the anatomical uh, contour of the uterine cavity and it's not the thickness of the lining, by God, it's got to be an immunologic factor. And then you go looking. You can be wrong, but you go looking for it. And when you look for an immunologic problem, there's something that needs to be basically understood. This, we were the first people in the world to uh, start giving uh, treatment for immunologic factors that affected implantation and IVF. We started using heparin. We were the first to use heparin infusions. Didn't work that well, but we used to use it. And now today we are using things. We used IVIG gamma globulin, which works, but is, a, is very expensive. Today we use intralipid to almost the exclusion of all else along with steroids. And we'll talk about that maybe later. But the important thing to understand is that in the uterus, in the lining of the uterus, what we call the decidia, after progesterone's had its effect on the uterine lining, there is a very complex and magnificent interaction of immunologic factors that determine the immunocompetence of the uterus. They're all brought about by lymphocytes, and 75% of all the lymphocytes in the uterine lining are what we call natural killer cells. They're large lymphocytes that journey from the bone marrow to the uterine lining every month, and there they proliferate under the effect of progesterone. So the important point is these natural killer cells are vital. If you don't have them, there's no species. And they can go wrong as they do sometimes. But there's another family of cells that only comprise 10 to 15% of all the lymphocytes in the uterus. And those are T cells, cytotoxic T cells. If those, those two factors, the natural killer cells and the T cells, the CD3 lymphocytes, the ones that are cytotoxic lymphocytes, those two together are the biggest causes of failure of an embryo to implant. And why? Because they both release substances called cytokines, of which there are three varieties, but the two that are important are the Th1 and Th2 cytokines. The Th2 cytokines are humoral. They attract the roots of the embryo into the wall of the uterus to form what is going to become the placenta. And the Th1 cytokines send those very same cells into suicide, into what we call apoptosis, as you know. And so the cells are culled down, the objective being to have the placenta form in the inner aspect of the wall of the uterus, uh, of the cavity, and come away with a baby. And also to promote the optimal respiratory, endocrinological, and nutritional needs of the growing conceptus. So for those reasons, you need a balance between Th1 and Th2 cytokines. Now, there are certain conditions where the Th1 cytokines, mainly interferon gamma and TNF-alpha, over-predominate. And what they do is they attack the roots of the embryo, send the cells into suicide. So many of the cells of the embryo's root system or trophoblast are destroyed that the embryo limps along and is lost before the woman sometimes even knows she's pregnant or she gets pregnant, she loses it in a few days as a chemical pregnancy, or she goes on and she has a pregnancy that miscarries, or worse of all, that pregnancy continues to grow, but the placenta has lost its potential to be fully developed and the baby suffers from placental insufficiency, intrauterine growth retardation, and you have problems that have to do with development of the baby. So for all of those reasons, 
it's extremely important when we do IVF, if we have a suspicion that something could impact the implantation process and it's immunologic to quantify, identify, typify it, and then address it. Now, when this excessive amount of TH1 cytokines produced, we referred, since most of them are produced by the natural killer cells, we talk about natural killer cell activation. Make the point that natural killer cells are absolutely essential. You can't survive without them. You've got to have some cytokine activity, but it's got to be in balance with TH1, TH2. And there are ways to deal with that. First thing is to make the diagnosis. If the embryo seems normal and there's no anatomical factors, and there's no endometrial lining issues, the by, by process of elimination, you, then you've got to look at the anatomical things. And as I told you, but then at the end, immunologic factors. The bottom line is it all comes down to natural killer cell activation, T cell activation, and if you hone in on those and you solve that problem, all the other tests that can cost eight to ten thousand dollars are redundant in my opinion. You need to do natural killer cell activation. You can do a blood test, which doesn't really measure the natural killer cells that are produced in the uterus, but it simulates it. So if you see that they're activated, that's the gold standard. It's not the concentration of natural killer cells that matters, the more the merrier. But if you've got natural killer cells that are activated, you've got a problem in your hands. And you can do the blood test called the K562 test. There are only three or four places in the country that can do that test. We use a place in Boston known as Reprosource Laboratory to do that. The second thing that you can do is you can measure TH1 cytokine activity and TH2. And if you do an endometrial biopsy and there's increased preponderance of the TH1 activity, that's a good test. But today, there's more and more evidence that a blood test that measures these same cytokines can give you a pretty good idea and usually matches with a K562 test. And then you measure the other things, such as antiphospholipid antibodies. You do an immunophenotype to look at the spread of all the lymphocytes. And you also do an anti-nuclear antibody test. And uh, that's for the so-called uh, to see if there is a problem. If you don't have natural killer cell activation, forget it. There's no other problem you need to worry about. But if you've got it, you've got to dig deeper. Yeah. And you mentioned the word suspicious. So when you're seeing an IVF patient and you're suspicious that this must be, might be present, what makes you suspicious? If a patient hasn't had a miscarriage or a biochemical pregnancy, is there something about her history that you're like, you know what, I should do this workup even before I do an embryo transfer? What kind of patient population are you doing that well, with? Well, you're looking at two causes of natural killer cell cytokinopathies, activations. The one is autoimmune and the other is alloimmune. Autoimmune is the vast majority, alloimmune in some cases. In the autoimmune variety, it's almost like the embryo steps into a minefield and it gets destroyed no matter what happens. And that happens in women who've got a personal or a family history of autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, celiac disease, MS. We can go on and on and on, many we don't even know about. But the bottom line is there's an autoimmune basis for it. It lays down and activates existing cells across the board. And that woman is usually, not always, not even going to know she was pregnant or she's going to have repeated chemical pregnancies. That kind of woman is easily treatable, easily. I have a young lady, who's not a young lady anymore, but she's from Australia. She's a doctor, pulmonologist. Husband was the head of psychiatry at Monash University. I was giving a lecture at Monash University a couple of years ago, and they came up to me and they said, look, we've had 23 failed embryo transfers. We have never seen a viable pregnancy. She had Hashimoto's disease, autoimmune disease of the thyroid, where 50% of the women have got activated natural killer cells. I published that in 1998. If there's increased natural killer cell activity, it doesn't matter how it got there. That's the cause of your problem. And so we tested her, we treated her for that. She had a baby in the next cycle at the age of 42 with an AMH of 0.1. I've got two eggs, two embryos, she had a baby. And that was simply because we found the cause of the problem. And the other one that you've got to be aware of, a third of women with endometriosis have an autoimmune underpinning. 
and they'll also have natural killer cell activations. So anybody with endometriosis, doesn't matter how severe, unfortunately, even before you can see it through a laparoscope, and possibly even before the BCL6 picks it up, those women can have activated natural killer cells just as easily as, as if they had stage four endometriosis. And so you've got to test them and treat them. If you treat those people, you cure their problem, you sweep the minefield, it's clear, the next embryo goes in, we'll take. Have, that brings up a, a good a question that I know some of my patients will have. If you, let's say, test them and you treat the natural killer cells, do you see a drop in the BCL6 level? I'm just wondering if that could... I don't be know the answer to that question yet. I don't think the studies yeah. have been done. But mm -hmm. I have the opinion that, you know, all the other tests we used to do, Integrin 3 and all those kind of things, all those tests are probably no more than a reflection of the fact that 50 to 60% of women who've got endometriosis have got antiphospholipid antibodies if you test them properly. You can't go sending blood off to LabCorp and one of these other labs because they don't do it with sufficient sensitivity and specificity. But if you go to a reproductive immunology laboratory like Reprosource or Finch University in Chicago, you'll find 60% of these women have got them. And what this is, is there's a phospholipid moiety involved in Integrin. And if they're antiphospholipid antibodies, it prevents its action. So I believe, and I don't know for sure, but I believe there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that many women who've got this beta-3 integrin deficiency and therefore have a, a problem with implantation may be linked to phospholipid antibodies and natural killer cells, but no one's ever looked at this yet. As far as BCL6 receptiva testing, I don't think there's data that shows that yet, but it's an interesting study to look at. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about a particular patient um, and maybe we'll, 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 I'll definitely look into her natural killer cell activity now. Maybe I'll, I'll have her actually reach out to you for that evaluation to make sure that it's as thorough as possible. And then maybe we'll repeat a biopsy after treatment. Because I know her BCL6 is elevated. Um, but that makes it very much more likely that she's got endometriosis, of course. Right. And she's definitely had the laparoscopy. She's been treated. And now we're preparing for a transfer. But we've worked really hard to get this one embryo for her. Bottom line is that with endometriosis, you don't have a primary autoimmune condition like lupus or rheumatoid or thyroid. But you've got a reaction, a reactionary process that regular antiphospholipid antibodies that are done in the regular reference laboratory, such as uh, um, looking at lupus anticoagulant or looking at cardiolipins, are not going to show you. You've got to spread them out. In this test, they look at 21 different types of antiphospholipid antibodies spanning IgG, IgM, and IgA. So it's really, in my opinion, well worthwhile to look at those things very carefully. It's not that the antiphospholipid antibodies themselves cause a problem, I don't think, even though there's evidence that they can harm the trophoblast. I think it's that some of them are linked to natural killer cell activation. And those are the ones that you've got to focus on. And anybody who tells you it, it, it's, not, it's not a factor, unfortunately, the very next question should be, all right, if you don't believe it, help me understand what it is you don't believe. And most people haven't taken the interest in immunology. It's a big field. It is. And I think that um, in medical schools and in fellowship programs across the country, we're trained to think that it's not a big deal. And then now through, you know, all these years of my practice, I feel like that, not that it was a shame that we didn't spend more time on that, but I feel like maybe, um, not maybe, I, I think that uh, you're definitely right. And so I feel like our, our minds are now opening up and I can see a trend among all my colleagues. And the trend is that we really feel like we're doing patients a disservice now. The service is not bringing up an immunologic factor for situations just like you're, you're presenting here. And I agree with you, but the big, another big disservice is that we then send them off to a laboratory like Reprosource. So run all the tests you can, the person gets a $10,000 bill. You don't need it. You need simple tests cost about $600 to $700 to know if there's a problem. Now, I mentioned earlier to you the two types of immunologic issues. The one issue is autoimmune. Again, get, get the concept that the uterus is like a minefield. Embryo gets in there, the 
The Th1 cytokines attack it, they kill it, and that's the end of the embryo. You don't even know you're pregnant or you lose it very early. That's why most people with this autoimmune variety don't even think they were pregnant. They're not getting pregnant. They have unexplained infertility, and all it means is undiagnosed. But there's another variety that causes problems as well, and that's alloimmune. And with this problem, it is the body regarding the embryo as an invading organism, as a hostile organism, and attacking it. And the, people don't realize that an embryo shouldn't take, we shouldn't exist as a species, because we differ immunologically from the, from the host. Anywhere else, if a gene, if a, if a bacteria or a virus enters your body, your body's immune system attacks it because it's different. But the embryo gets into the uterus, attaches in the wall, and it, it doesn't get attacked. And it doesn't get attacked because of a tremendous compensatory mechanism. Uh, we call this the immunologic riddle of pregnancy. Why is it that an embryo that should never take in, in the human takes? And that's because of compensations made, and I won't go into it here, in the uterine lining, involving all these cells I told you about, the MCH, uh, major histocompatibility compatibility, class one antigens, and all these things that affect these cells that allows that embryo and only will allow an embryo that's different if it's adapted. And if the embryo is too similar and shares certain genes, mainly the transplant gene, DQ-alpha, uh, and other HLA, GHLA genes, then what happens is the embryo is regarded as a foreign body and is attacked. But it takes repeated exposures to an embryo before that happens. And many women end up having a baby. And then they can't get pregnant or they miscarry. And one of the commonest causes of secondary infertility, a woman who's had a full-term pregnancy and then can't get pregnant, is this so-called alloimmune variety, where it is due to the immunologic similarities. And the similarity occurs because when the sperm enters the egg, it injects into the egg the genes that came from the father, the paternal antigen. And the embryo then matches the uterus. And now after repeated exposures over time, natural killer cells build up as a mechanism whereby the uterus is trying to get rid of that so-called invading organism and the woman keeps miscarrying or can't get pregnant again. But if she's only got a match of DQ alpha, for example, but she doesn't have natural killer cell activation, she's not got a problem. It's only after that natural killer cell activation is unmasked that she will have the problem of failing to conceive. So if you get a woman who's had repeated miscarriages, uh, especially if she's had a baby initially and then keeps on miscarrying, it's far more likely to be alloimmune, even though that's the least common variety of immunologic Im implantation dysfunction. Yeah. And I think what you're, what you're describing so well is parental compatibility, right? And, and is that the kind of evaluation that you also do for patients who reach out to you for this kind of workup? Well, my practice is rather unique because I see everybody else's people that have failed over and over and they, people give up on them and they give up on themselves. So my practice, hardly anybody is, who comes to me has failed less than three IVFs and they're older and they've been through the mill. So there's a lot of emotional compatibility something I believe so strongly in, and I know you do or you wouldn't be doing this. You can teach people to give care, but you can't teach people to care. And you've got to care about people. You've got to care about your patients. You've got to nurture them as if they are the center of the universe and they've got to feel it. Only then will you get further and get them to do the things that oftentimes so many other physicians have told them, don't go there, it's nonsense. But they don't often know exactly why they're saying that when you ask them. So truthfully, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, people come to you, come to me because they're failing repeatedly or miscarrying repeatedly, or they've had repeated unexplained IVF failures with good embryos. And those are the ones that I hone in on mostly. I don't do this on everybody unless there is a background history of autoimmune disease in their family or themselves. Then I'll look. Otherwise, it's women that have failed repeatedly or miscarried repeatedly. So if a patient out there is listening to us and they're saying, you know what, now that I'm hearing this, I'm suspicious that this might be happening with me. What do they, how do they communicate with their doctors so that they get this testing? And if not, how can they engage with you? Okay. Firstly, the last thing I want to do here or anywhere else is come between a patient and their doctor. 
It's not my role. And I'm fortunately in the stage of my career where I'm not career building any longer. I'm trying to do less than I did by a major factor. But I want to still make the third act of this play called life, professional life, meaningful for myself. And for me, it's meaningful if I can help people who've got problems that others don't want to address or maybe aren't ready to address. I'm not here to interfere the doctor, but clearly if people want to work with their own doctor, I invite those doctors through them to call me and I will walk them through things. I, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost the patient anything. I'll spend time explaining and going through every step. In fact, all the patients I speak to get about a 30-page letter with articles backing up everything. And in that letter, I invite them to take the letter to their doctors. Many of their doctors say, how do we buy that? We don't believe it. That's their problem and I can't help that. But if they feel they want me to be helping them, then the way to do that is to go to my website, which you mentioned earlier on, shareivf.com, or to call my assistant. And the phone number there is 702-533-2691. Her name is uh, Patty. She's lovely. Happens to be a horse whisperer. Patty will always take your call, and she's wonderful. She is the greatest asset I've got in my practice. She's a wonderful person, and she will arrange for us to have an online one-hour consultation after the patients fill in a detailed questionnaire. And then I spend an hour before I see them to lay things out in a template. I talk to them for an hour, then I send them a letter. And it's up to them after that. If they want to go back to their doctors, I'm available to them and to their referring doctor if it's a referring doctor. And even if it's not, if they if they are interested. And I also want to talk about your book and where patients can find it. And I know you've written more than one, but specifically unexplained IVF, failure and recurrent pregnancy loss, the immunologic link. Can you just let us know a little bit about that book and where patients can find it? It's a 45 page ebook, which I wrote free of charge. Anybody who goes to my website, shareivf.com can access the book free of charge. And it will explain everything we've spoken about in far more detail than we have time to do now. And um, it's also got case reports in it. And so they can read it and download it from the website and just grab it. Share, they'll have to have an appointment with me to do that. It's free and available to everyone at no cost. That's great. That's really great. What kind of trends do you see in the future for our field? future trends, I should say. I see more and more telemedicine. I see more and more. I can consult with the patient for an hour on the internet just as personally as I can do face-to-face. -face. It's more convenient. And my patients come from all over the world. They come from over 50 different countries. And most of them are not in my area. They come from all over. It's not convenient for them to fly to Las Vegas or to New York to meet with me for an hour. It's a waste of money and time. We can talk, I can lay out a plan of action. Almost everything I would need can be obtained, can be, can be done in, in their own home setting. And as I said earlier, I'm more than happy to work with them and their doctors if the doctor feels comfortable. Often doctors don't feel comfortable deferring to another person in the same field. I can't help that. But it's very easy for me to consult with people, and I do with all over the world. Sometimes using interpreters to translate the language. So it's, it's really not a problem to make contact that way. And I think telemedicine is going to be the way of the future to a large extent. I think there's also going to be a move towards larger centers over time because in, it's much more cost effective. I can give you an example, if I may. We introduced PGT, as I told you, in the field of IVF in 2004. Obviously, uh, it's not cost effective to do all your own NGS, uh, next generation gene sequencing tests on your own patients. We had our own lab. Very quickly, it was ridiculous. So I decided to hand it over to one of the genetics labs in New York with Santiago Monet. He actually came to Las Vegas to see what we were doing. And, uh, and, and Jacques Cohen, they developed it. And they rolled it out all over the country. We didn't do it. We didn't patent it. We didn't try to do anything like that, maybe we should have, but we didn't. I wanted to get it out. And so with these kinds of things, genetic testing and all these things that, that are available, 
today the whole field is becoming technologically advanced. We are doing more and more tests on eggs. You may or may not be aware that we published a paper in, uh, in uh, what's it, RBM Online. It was one of the last papers that was accepted by, uh, what's his name, Edwards before he passed away. It was published on how to test eggs for the genetic integrity. We published a paper and showed that if you actually do polar body biopsies on eggs before you freeze them and you know which ones of the eggs are euploid, chromosomally normal, you get a six times greater take rate per fertilized embryo that comes from that egg um, if you transfer that as compared to eggs out of an egg bag. Never went anywhere. It's very cost costly to do. But again, I think we're moving more and more into a direction where genetics is going to play a role, testing of sperm more intricately is going to play a role. Larger centers are needed to be able to offer all these things. But if smaller centers get together and form coalitions where they can cost contain, it may be just as effective. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Ah, so good. Um, is there, before we you know, end our interview, is there anything else you want to share with our listeners today? I only want to say this, and this is really important. If you've got a complex problem and you're not getting pregnant with IVF, we may not know the reason always, but there is always a reason. It could be as simple as the doctor doing the embryo transfer doesn't have the technique down. I've seen that. I mean, I've, I've worked with over 100 REs in the development of this field because we started, as I said earlier, the first private program in the country. So, but it could be as simple as that, or it could be as complex as the issues like we spoke about immunologic. I can only say this. Don't sell yourself down the tube simply because of the fact that no one can give you an answer and says, well, it didn't work last time, it was bad luck, let's try again. That may be the case, but usually it's not. Remember, there's no such thing as unexplained infertility. It just means we can't explain it now or we're not looking deep enough to find out why things are happening. And it's only when we do find out why they're happening that we can fix it. If women are miscarrying repeatedly, don't give up on yourself and just say, you know, I'm miscarrying. The doctor says, eventually I'll be lucky. The likelihood is you're not going to be lucky. You've got to find a cause for the problem, even if in the end it means that you need to use someone else to carry your baby or you need someone else's eggs to make embryos to put in you. But someone's going to be open with you, direct and transparent, so you can make informed choices. It's never the role of the doctor to tell the patient what to do. It's our role to give information so they can make their own informed decisions. I feel like you should have several courses for young, you know, you know, phys physicians just coming out of training. And I love your quote. I'm going to make sure to share that and definitely give you credit. You can teach people to give care, but you can't teach people to care. And that's, there's, that's very, very true. And I'm just so glad that you care as much as you do because you're a great example for all of us with how you continue to inspire you. us. You're, you're, you continue to move the field forward. And I hope by sharing this interview on the podcast that other people will be inspired by what you say and they'll stand up for themselves and they'll ask questions of their doctors. That's the bottom line. Yeah. But, you know, when I look at people like you coming up, young people in the field, obviously knowledgeable obviously caring, obviously trying to take a step in the right direction, it makes me feel very proud because when we started IVF, there was a 5 to 10% chance of pregnancy. When we reported 20% birth rates, uh, Jones from uh, Virginia sent a team, which included Zev Rosenwax, to come and see what we were doing, that we were producing these rates, and then were satisfied that we were, and they were very simple things that we were doing. And the bottom line is today, we're at the stage where if you do two or three embryo transfers of well-chosen embryos in a younger woman, because the older you get, the poorer the quality of your eggs, the chance of having a baby can be upwards of 75% if you avail yourself of all options. It's a big, big change, but it's not about getting a woman pregnant and getting her even to have a baby. It's about the quality of life after birth. It's our role to optimize the quality of life so that the offspring can have the same opportunities that we've had 
to aspire to greater things. If we're going to bring babies into this world that didn't develop properly because we didn't establish the proper environment which is established before you even get pregnant without knowing it, we are going to, uh, we're not doing a service. I think that's the direction we have to go. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you again for your time today. Um, I hope you'll join us back on the show sometime soon, will you? I'd love to, anytime. Thank you. Good luck to you. Wonderful. If you ever get to Las Vegas or New York, come and visit us. I definitely will. I, I hope Thank to. you so okay. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 